There are ways in which we can tilt the odds in our favor. It gets back to something that Bill Miller taught me many years ago, where the reason Bill Miller was able to buy 15% of Amazon at a time when the company seemed to be going bankrupt to most people was because... I was really curious about this question. So, so I caught your podcast and you were mentioning that in 2021, you were invited into this Zoom call with Charlie, with Lou Simpson, with Chris Davis, mm. with I don't know who else was there. Probably how yeah, no, Chris there? wasn't there, but uh, there was a guy called Mark Nelson, who's a famous Australian investor, great Australian investor. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was an amazing experience. I realized, and you mentioned that your book was actually the homework. What I just wanted to understand was, did Manga has this, you know, weekly calls with various investors? And what was the point of, of the book being a homework? Like, like, was it just to cover each other's blind spots, to discuss investment opportunities? Or, or like, like, what kind of Zoom call was that? Well, Manga, I think, had already read the book because uh, Monish had sent him a copy. But, but I think Manga had even forgotten that I'd ever interviewed him. I mean, Manga has so many people coming at him and this was like a small interview. And so he, he loved the book, but he was like, who the hell is this guy? I can't really remember him. And so this friend of his who was on the weekly call, this venture capitalist, contacted me and arranged for me to come on the call and to be a guest speaker. And and so, yeah, I guess I'm not sure that whether, I don't think Lou Simpson would necessarily have read the book otherwise. And so... You know, Lou Simpson had run Geico and was this legendary investor. And so, yeah, I guess it meant that they could then chat about the book and explore these themes. So it kind of gave leaping off point to have a discussion about investing and life. But I think I think what's really very revealing is that Munger, who was then probably 98 and was pretty immobile, couldn't get around very easily, had structured his life so that he was surrounded by friends who were smart and interesting and engaged and who continued to talk to him about subjects that he found energizing. And so in a way, there's, some, there's, some, there's something very important about that insight, that it wasn't just about wealth maximization. His life was full of these rich relationships and this continuous learning, right? He, he praised Buffett for being a continuous learning machine. And so in a way... Those 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 breakfasts are a perfect example of here's a guy in the middle of COVID. How is he going to have company, have a social life? He said to me, I, I got on about five minutes early because I knew he always started any he always arrived for any meeting early. And so as a result, I was on my own with him at the start. And he said to me, I said something like, you know, it's wonderful to be here with you. And he said something slightly facetious and, and morbid about how at my age, it's kind of wonderful to be anywhere, you know, like just, just to be anywhere is pretty good. And, and he said, being, uh, he said, Zoom has been enormously helpful to me. And so, you know, I think it's just a small point, but I sometimes think about, you know, my, my book group and I'm like, God, it's such a pain in the butt arranging these meetings and, you know, I'm rereading Proust for the book group because we only read classic fiction. And and it's like I emailed everyone a couple of days ago and said, should we meet in this restaurant next week? And not a single one of these people has bothered to reply to me. And there's part of me that's like, why am I doing this? I'm like too busy. I've got too many things to do anyway. And then I'm like, no, but I get to sit down with a bunch of really interesting, really nice authors, among other things. Most most of them are authors and chat about great fiction while going, you know, eating good food and drinking good wine. That's that's very central to a rich life. And so in a way, you know, when in a way I'm cloning Munger there, because when I was younger, I, I, I was so busy just trying to succeed that I really let a lot of my relationships wilt on the vine. Because I, I used to I used to live in Hong Kong. And so from about 2001 to 2006, I, I was at Time magazine in Hong Kong. And initially as the deputy editor and then as the editor of the Asian edition of Time and so you can imagine, it was just an insane work life. I mean, I was just working constantly. So to invest a lot in relationships was really hard. And then I went to London to edit the European Middle East and African edition of time. So if you're working 70, 80 hours a week, and you're trying to get ahead, and you're in a very competitive work environment, very hard to have rich relationships. And now, I think partly because I see these great investors structuring their lives so that relationships and continuous learning are central. I've managed to kind of justify it to myself. And then 
you, you know, for me, I feel a lot of guilt often that I, I spend so much time studying spiritual stuff like Kabbalah and Tibetan Buddhism and, and reading fiction. And I've, I've sort of weirdly, it's turned out not to be a digression. It's weirdly turned out to be very central to what I do because you're able, there's a, there's a, there's a very good writer and thinker, a guy called Josh Waitskin, who, who wrote a book called The Art of Learning, which is a terrific book. And, and the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer is actually about him. He was the chess prodigy that that was based on. And he talks about this, this phrase, thematic interconnectedness. And I find that a lot, that when you study a different field, like spirituality or history or economics or whatever, not that I ever study economics, you occasionally buy an economics book, but then I don't read. But, the, uh, but, but when you study different fields, you discover this thematic interconnectedness. So you find a principle in one area. And this is something that Munger did a lot. And then you can apply it elsewhere. So even something like the, the concept of margin of safety, that's an idea that comes from engineering. But Ben Graham and then Buffett and Munger and, and Howard Marks and all these other great investors brought it into the world of value investing. And so the, the ability to read broadly in a way that seems kind of aimless, turns out to be an incredibly rich habit. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm rereading Proust and you, you read, you know, In Search of Lost Time, which is, you know, one, one of the greatest novels of all time. It's 4,000 pages, I think. And so this time around, I'm about 500 pages in and I've twice failed before. Once when I was about 18, I got 1,000 pages in. And then when I was 40, I got 3,500 pages in. And and this time, I, I don't know how much I'll read, but I'm nearly 500 pages in. And there's a part early on where you're seeing this, this extraordinary character, Charles Swan, who's a very central character in the novel. And you see everybody judging him and constructing his personality through different lenses of some view him differently because he's Jewish. Some view him differently because he's a legendary art collector. Some view him differently because he's a legendary womanizer. So, you know, like they're all kind of piecing together his character. And you realize that his character is not a stable, solid entity that's one thing. And that has huge ramifications, both for investing and everything else, because you start to think, well, what is this thing that I'm studying? Like, like, is it a stable, does it have a clear identity? And this this gets back, I mean, it sounds crazy, but as Munger said, everything is one damn relatedness after another. It gets back to something that Bill Miller taught me many years ago, where the reason Bill Miller was able to buy 15% of Amazon at a time when the company seemed to be going bankrupt to most people was because he'd studied philosophy. And he said he would look at, he would look at Amazon and he'd say, well, everybody is misperceiving it. They, they don't understand what Amazon really is. They look at this company in, in the rubble after the tech bubble, after the internet bubble of 1999, 2000, 2001 had kind of burst. They look at it and they're like, well, here's this crappy company that's going to go bankrupt, that's money losing, that's run by a billionaire who took advantage of all of us and then vaporized our money. And he's like, I look at it. And because I studied Wittgenstein, William James, and all these great philosophers, and I'm obsessed with perception, how to perceive reality clearly, I look at it and I say, well, what really is Amazon? And he says, well, it's an extremely profitable company with a cost advantage, but those profits are not yet visible because they choose to keep reinvesting the money in the business to build a greater competitive advantage. So it seems to be unprofitable. It seems to be money losing. But in the long run, it'll turn out to be extremely profitable. And so his, his variant perception, his ability to see reality more clearly enabled him to make this enormous winning bet on Amazon and which he's held, you know, for more than two decades. So he said to me at one point, he talked to Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. He said, is your proxy statement accurate? And Bezos was like, yeah. And he said, well, in that case, I own more Amazon personally than anybody else in the world, any other individual not named Bezos. This is before Bezos and Mackenzie, his wife, divorced because she she had more than uh, more than Bill. But uh, you know, so that ability to perceive reality more clearly than other pe people turned out to be you know this absolutely invaluable habit for Bill. He wasn't seeing it through these eyes of prejudice. When I'm reading Proust, I'm like, oh, that's 
it's the same thing. It's like, look how they're constructing and distorting the personality of Charles Swan. They're looking at this guy and they're creating his personality. And you see it in these extraordinarily vivid ways, right? Like for, for he, you know, he famously falls in love with this woman who's basically, basically like a hooker. Basically, she's a high class hooker who's taking advantage of his, of his wealth and influence and power. And at a certain point, the, the power equation switches because he's so obsessed with her that you have this woman who in certain parts of society has no power, no influence, no credibility. And she's totally dominating this guy who's like hanging out with print, the prince of princes and princesses and, you know, is at the highest level of society. And so he is a different thing to her. You know, she, she's distorting who he is. He's distorting who, who she is. Everyone is... Everyone's sort of creating their own reality. And so when you read literature, you start to be like, oh, it gives me a way of understanding these themes that run through everything else that I need to see clearly. And I need to understand my own prejudices, my own biases, that it's, I'm not, I'm not, I shouldn't trust my own view of everything. And, and again, with this being one damn relatedness after another, one of the things that Munger and Buffett were doing was they had a partnership where the other one could challenge their views. And so in a world where most people are living in an echo chamber and everyone just wants to confirm what they already believe to be true, here are these two guys who structured their life so that someone would come in and challenge their views. So, you know, Munger was a Republican, but who ends up voting for Hillary Clinton, you know, and, and switched his views on abortion. Um, I mean, that's an extraordinary thing. How many people do you know who, who changed their views on something as fundamental as abortion? So that's someone who's very actively looking for disconfirming evidence, looking to challenge his own biases. And, and so that's something that I'm very, I'm very much trying to do in my own life to say, why, why do I believe that? And why do I assume that I'm right? Why, on what possible basis do I think that me with my little pea brain sitting here in Irvington, New York, viewing the world through this tiny, narrow lens, why, why should I have some monopoly on truth? And so just to have that kind of open-mindedness to say, let me let me listen to other people. Let me try to explore what other people think. And let me challenge my own biases and prejudices. It's very, it's very helpful. So I think that's one thing that you get out of out of reading literature, but it's also one thing you get out of studying studying the great investors. That ability to open yourself up to disconfirming evidence, to look, to ask yourself, why might I be wrong? Not, well, here's why. I know I'm right, and I'm gonna tell you why I'm right. Like, what what do I know? Probably half of what I've told you is wrong. Sorry. I just don't know which half. Thank you. I mean, even you, even something as fundamental as the question we asked before, where I said to, to Ed Thorpe, do you believe in God? And he said, no data. Even something as fundamental as that, people can't agree on. That's a, that's a very, I mean, talk about things like uh, the afterlife or reincarnation. I happen to believe in reincarnation. Even something as fundamental as that. I mean, the, the, the Kabbalists and the Buddhists and, and the Hindus all seem to agree on this. A lot of people don't. So these very fundamental things like whether God exists, whether we're reincarnated, whether we get, you know, when people say, well, you only have one life. I'm like, really? How do you know? On what basis? Like these very fundamental central questions, you don't know. And even, you know, so that that should lead to a little humility, right? To us just being a little more humble about the limits of our own knowledge and a little more tolerant of other people's views. You know, I, I can't say, you know, is, is Ed Thorpe the fool there or am I the fool there? And, and it's actually even more complicated than that because I think we create our own reality. So, so you know, our perception of things alters our reality. So when, when Charles Swan is looking at Odette, this woman who's basically a high class hooker and thinks she's the most precious, beautiful woman on earth and has these rare qualities. He's creating that reality and he can't see what everyone else sees, which is that she's just doing this masterful job of exploiting him while sleeping with everyone else. You know, so we create our own reality. So, so Ed may in fact be right when he says there's no God. And I may be right when I say there's God. Because we both created our reality. Like we, so, so even for these, sorry, and I don't mean to go off on this weird digression. But but it gives you a sense of just how little we really know. And so look at look at someone like Sir John Templeton. You look at who I write about in I think chapter two of the book. His his uh, his charitable foundation. I think the motto 
of the Charitable Foundation is something like, how little we know, how eager to learn. Boy, is that a good mindset for life. If you, if you, if you combine the humility to say, I don't know, the habit of compounding knowledge, exploring things with an open mind, listening to other people, reading widely. It's a very powerful habit. That's, that, that mindset is very powerful rather than like, listen to me, I know. And that is really profound. It's like being humble at the same time, knowing that we could be wrong, but at the same time, having the humility to keep on learning, knowing that we could be wrong. And if, if, like what you said, right, if we just cultivate that attribute, we just keep on going, keep on compounding that 1% every single day, right, we will be able to achieve the definition of success that we all have, which every one of us could be very different. Yeah. Or at, le- or at least to take, tr- to take Tom Gaynor's phrase, we can be directionally correct. So mm-hmm. we, you know, it's not that we nail everything and we're perfect. Like I'm constantly screwing up. I'm constantly falling off track. And, and, but if you're directionally correct, if you've got a good target for, you know, this is, this is what constitutes a rich and abundant life for me. These are the habits. These are the inputs that are going to get me there, whether it's reading, compounding goodwill, saving, investing, living within your means, exercise, good nutrition, meditation, you know, or walking in nature to, clear your mind or whatever it is. If you think of the destination, good destination, think of the inputs that are going to get you there. And then you keep compounding that stuff. And then as you screw up and you fall off track, you know, the thing that I keep saying to my kids again and again, I quote this, this great Western meditation teacher called Sharon Salzberg. And I, I, I ran into her a few months ago and I said to her, this has had a huge effect on me and my family. She would say, let go with self-compassion and begin again. So every time, you know, I have a 22-year-old daughter, every time she she is like despairing about herself in some way, she's screwed up in some way, she failed to get to a class because she's always late for everything as I am. And, and I said, I'll say to her, let go with self-compassion and begin again. And so, you know, you find these habits that are going to get you to a, a decent destination. But you also have to be aware that you're not going to do perfectly. You're going to screw up. You're going to fail. You're going to stumble. You're going to get knocked off course. And I think maybe that's been one of the most helpful things about spending a great deal of time with billionaires and famous investors and the like, and and with a lot of very well-known authors who I get to spend a lot of time with, is you you see how screwed up so many of them are. And so you can see that you you don't fall into the trap of idealizing people and think, oh, if only I could be so rich and so successful. It's like, no, oh, they're a mess too. I, I see friends of mine who are well-known investors. They still have daughters with anorexia and bulimia, and they still have wives who don't love them and, uh, you know, who chase off after other men. And they still they still have a temper and they still have blind spots and they still have ego. And I think that's very valuable to because I tend to look at myself and be like, what an idiot, you know, and, and, you know, I'm, I think, I mean, I don't know if you have this in, I, I suspect that maybe growing up in England, as I did, we were pretty brutal to ourselves. Like you learn, you learn to succeed by beating yourself up. And I think probably that's for a lot of people in places like Singapore and Hong Kong and Tokyo, like a lot of Jewish families like mine, we succeeded by trying to please our parents, trying to please our teachers beating ourselves up when we didn't do well when we failed and it's a that approach works for a while it can make you very successful but it can't really make you happy and so i i think in a way you have to reparent yourself and start to think well so is there a gentler softer way that i can do it is there a kinder and more loving self-compassionate way and and so I mean, to to me, recognizing the imperfection of a lot of these great investors, in a way, one of the lessons that I'm trying to internalize is, well, they're imperfect. Why should I not be imperfect? Let me, when I screw up, it's not about giving myself a blank slate so I can be unethical and, you know, lie and cheat and be a bully or whatever. You know, it's not like, oh, well, they're all flawed, so I can be. It's more about like, when I do something that I'm embarrassed by or that I fail at or whatever, let go with self-compassion and begin again. And I think that that's a very powerful habit to adopt early on, to be to be kind to yourself, kind to others. And, you know, 
I would take on this idea of I should try to be kinder to others, but it was very, very hard for me to take on the idea of trying to be kind to myself. Like that, That's a very hard, I mean, I don't know if, is, is that something for you that's difficult culturally? Is that, does that seem like not a way to approach life? I, I think like what you say, because sometimes we, we are, we grew up in this culture that, you know, success, especially monetary wise, academic wise is everything that we end up being very harsh on ourselves. Right. Yeah. And, that indirectly makes life become more miserable than it should be. So yeah. I think when what you share with me really remind me to be grateful and celebrate that little success that we already yeah. have in life and yeah. then keep on learning. Like what you say, humble ourselves that we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And yeah. at the same time, keep on learning. And that's how we keep on improving. And that's how... I think eventually we're able to love ourselves even more. Yeah. And in a way, I mean, I, re I remember saying to my son at one point, I, I have a 25 year old son. It's really a beautiful human being who's a, a teacher. And I said to him, you should do a meditation where you kind of picture yourself as a, as a baby or a little boy. And you're kind of like cradling yourself. And, and, you know, it's like you're, you're, compassionate to yourself in that way and he did it and i think it was, it was very moved by it i think it was a weirdly emotional thing for him because it's like you know we're thrown into this world with no rules we have no idea how to operate we're born into weird families with weird weird histories that have had to struggle and survive through incredibly difficult times and so they had these sort of coping mechanisms that that got them through but may not be particularly healthy or maybe or maybe they were very healthy to get us to a certain point, but then they stopped being helpful. So, you know, we have to in some way become our own parents and be like, how am I going to, am I going to find a better, kinder, wiser way through? And so for, for me, part of studying the great investors is a way of looking at these highly rational, highly intelligent, thoughtful people as a filter for looking at what works and doesn't work and why, which is again, a phrase from Munger. Munger said, I, I, I look at what works and doesn't work and why. And so you look at a life like Munger's and you're like, all right, so lost his first son to leukemia at the age of nine. And it was just crushing. And he just cried all of the time. But and, and it cost it cost him a fortune in terms of medical bills. And he he and his wife split up and he had no money and his life was a wreck. So you learn something about the importance of resilience, the fact that even in an incredibly successful life like that, where he lived to almost a hundred, is a is a legend and is widely beloved. And yet he still went through the ringer. He still had tremendous pain and suffering. And so you learn that resilience is going to be a really key part of any successful life, right? And so when he talks about refusing to indulge in self-pity, that's a huge learning from him, right? So so when I'm looking at what works and doesn't work and why I have to say, okay, so, so Munger's refusal to engage in self pity, that works. The importance of, of building rich relationships, surrounding yourself with friends who, even when you're immobile, get on a zoom call with you every week and chat about the world that works. That's rich. Taming your own mind, getting equanimity. That's important exercise, things like that, you know, to deal with stress. I mean, obviously, you, I don't need to talk to you, you're much better at exercise than I am. But the, you know, it's, it's in a way, it's like going through life, looking at this kind of buffet of options and being like, okay, I'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, I can see that I want to clone this from Munga, this from Monish, this from Tom Gaynor. And, and so, I mean, I would encourage you as you read the book, don't, don't, you know, t take a simple idea and take it seriously. Like when you find something that resonates deeply with you, think about how am I going to pound this into myself? How am I going to take this idea from a manga or from a Monish or from a Nick Sleep? You know, if you, if you take Nick Sleep's commitment to quality in the deepest sense of the word, in, in everything, and you make it a central tenet of your life, it will change your life. I mean, if if you take the idea of compounding goodwill from Guy Spear and Tom Gaynor and you make it a central tenet of your life, it will change your life. Like these are very powerful habits. And and so there's a kind of Lollapalooza effect, to use another manga term, when you take several of these things and you add them together. And so these small things don't seem like such a big deal. But if say you're truthful, you operate with integrity, you're kind, you're compassionate, you have good habits like continuous learning, being open to disconfirming evidence, you add together 
things like that. And it starts to become very powerful. It's, it's the, it's the compounding effect over time of these powerful habits that add up that that's so the the pompous phrase that i use that i stole from from someone else from sir david brailsford is the aggregation of marginal gains you find these things that give you a marginal advantage like well if i exercise or i meditate or i'm a continuous learning machine that gives me a marginal gain you add you add those things together you aggregate them and it becomes overwhelming over time just like what william said right like like it's an ongoing journey i right? keep on learning keep on improving and i think the greatest takeaway from for me in this interview is life is not just about richness in wealth but holistically and kindness to me sometimes you know when i feel that oh when I need to give, my mindset will be like, oh, then what am I losing out? But you make yeah. me see that by giving, actually there is so much more freedom and there's so much more abundance that I can cultivate inner peace or like my inner self. That is so beautiful. Thank you so much. That's a, I mean, you've, you've tapped into a very profound and powerful secret that runs through, I mean, it goes back to the statement that this teacher of mine said, the big man is the small man and the small man is the big man. That it's like when the when the ego is small, when it's less about me, 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 you smell that in someone. And so when you when you go have a meeting with someone and you realize they're looking to get something out of you and they're looking to get an edge on you in some way that they view life as a zero sum game and you you have to lose for them to win or something, you smell it, I think. And you never want to deal with that person again. And when you meet people who view life more as an infinite game, there's not a winner or a loser. It's like, we can all win. Let me, let me share with you. Let me find ways to, to share with you. Let me find ways to help you. You see it with an Arnold Vandenberg, right? Where for Arnold to have a successful life, it's a more successful life if he sees me happier and more successful. Like that gives him joy. I mean, this is a great Buddhist quality, right? Empathetic joy to get empathetic joy out of other people's success. And so, so it's this great paradox that if you approach life more in that sense, and you, then you surround pe- yourself with people who are giving and sharing and kind and compassionate, it starts to be this kind of, uh, there starts to be this sort of benevolent effect, this kind of flywheel. And, and then it becomes kind of miraculous because instead of you having to watch yourself and be like, who's who's out to screw me you're like actually like you feel like the world is kind of a benevolent place and you don't want to be naive about it i mean it's not about being stupid i mean i did i i did an interview with tom gainer on the on the podcast where we discussed this and it's worth listening to that because he would say extend trust first extend love first and then see who reciprocates and so if you extend love and trust first and people take advantage of you then you're like, okay, that's not a person I need to have in a really big way in my life. You know, if they're a family member, I'll see them, I'll talk to them. But, I, you know, it's not like the most important part of my circle. So you're not being naive, but you're building trust-based, love-based relationships. And then you're surrounding yourself with those people who treat you decently. And you look at you look at Munger and Buffett, that was a relationship built on trust and mutual admiration. They weren't trying to exploit each other. I mean, Buffett famously said, I, I've seen Charlie take the wrong side of the deal on many occasions and knowingly take the worst side of a deal on many occasions. And when, when you know, we apportioned blame and credit, he would take more of the blame than he deserved and less of the credit than he deserved. And when I asked Munger about how to have a happy life, he, he just starts talking about relationships. And he says, Warren has been a marvelous partner to me and I've been a good partner to him. So even in that wording, he gave himself less credit than Warren. And so you start to look at that and you start to be like, oh, so certain behavior tilts the odds in my favor of having a happy life. And you don't have control over the outcome. We don't know, you know, what the outcome will be, but there are ways of t- tilting the odds in your favor. So this in a way, I'll, I'll leave you with this thought because I don't want to exhaust you you guys too much, too, 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 too droning on too long. But in a way, the, the underlying principle of Richer, Wiser, Happier, the book, is there are ways in which we can tilt the odds in our favor of having a successful and happy life. And we don't have control over the outcome. Charlie did not have control over the outcome of his son getting leukemia, but he had control 
over whether he let it destroy his entire life, whether he fell into self-pity and despair. He had, you know, I mean, his first marriage ended in divorce. I mean, and he didn't have money. You know, he, he rebuilt his life. He ended up with eight children and stepchildren. He was married for like 50 years. And, you know, he lost his eye. He had a glass eye. He had his choice over whether he fell into despair. You know, he said to me, he said, it's a very helpful attitude to see life as a series of adversities, each of which gives you an opportunity to behave well or badly. And so that's a very helpful attitude. And so it's not that life is going to be super easy because you're rich or super easy because you're famous. It's, you know, I mean, the Buddha talked about the nature of suffering, right? There's suffering. People suffer. It's difficult. So you have to build resilience. You have to invest in your equanimity, your relationships, accept that it's part of the human condition, that people, you, you know, there are going to be difficult times. But if you behave in certain ways, if you control your own mindset, your own behavior, the way that you treat people in your relationships, you're tilting the odds in your favor of a positive outcome. And, and so you want to control what you can control. You can control your own behavior not the outcome. But if you keep plugging away, doing the smart thing, doing the wise thing, avoiding the dumb thing over and over again, at a certain point, the odds of it turning out well become kind of overwhelming. So just just find find habits, ways of behavior that are going to tilt the odds in your favor. And you're you're lucky because you're starting very young. So Chloe, you can you have much more of a runway than many of us. So you you adopt these sensible habits. It took me a long time to figure this stuff out. I was like, I was probably 52 or 53 when this book came out. So, I mean, I was distilling these ideas for myself in my late 40s and early 50s. It took a long time to figure this stuff out. And I'm still, you know, not living up to it. But at least now I know more about how to build a successful life, happy life. And thank you so much for all your kindness, sharing with us your wisdom today. Now, I just want to really just wrap it up with what William shared the last, right? Like about the power of choice, right? We all have this power of choice to become a better person. And I think throughout the whole interview, it came to me that it was, it's daunting to me that, you know, richer, wiser, happier. The most of the time we tend to focus on wealth, but if you focus on relationship and that will immensely make you become happier over time. And I think when you become happier, things start to fall in place. And this is definitely something that I truly want to work on as well to become a better person, to build better relationships. So thank you so much, William, for really sharing with us. All right. It's a so, real pleasure. And I, I hope I hope it's been helpful. And I hope I'll see you in Omaha again. End of end of April, is it? Sort of May, May, yeah. May first around. May May first, second, third around then. Thank so you. I, I hope I'll see you there. I Mentioned earlier, this is one of the greatest investing books I've ever read. I think it really impacted the most on me because it's not just about investing principles. And I think based on the interview that we just had, you guys also realize that it's so much richer when we focus on the bigger thing, right? Which is actually about life. So go and read this book if you have not. And also go and check out William's podcast. He really delves so deep into different things, right? With so many great investors and you will learn a lot a lot from that as well, right? So before we wrap up, maybe we can also take a group photo together. Is that okay with mm -hmm. you, William? Sure, sure, sure. Thank I, you. I should do my hair then. You look very, very great. <laughs> I love that. All right, so I'm just going to, yeah, everybody please switch on your camera as well. Thank you so much, William. Once again, it's really our honor and our pleasure to be here with you and you've been so generous to every single one of us with your knowledge, your wisdom, just like how Charlie has been so generous and kind to all his disciples. And we are your disciples because you uh, have really devoted so much wisdom and, and love uh, to us as well. That, that's very kind of you. But if you knew what a schmuck I am half the time, you would you would not regard yourself as disciples. I, I have a close friend who, who has a beautiful phrase where he talks about being friends along the path. And I, I think I think that's a better way to view it. We're, we're all friends along the path. We're trying to figure out how to live, how to be better people, how to build truly rich, rich lives. And so, yeah, it's not it's really not about being a disciple, because if you saw how stupidly I do half the things I do, you, you would be like, really, that's not a person I want to follow. 
it's uh, it's being friends along the path We're, and 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 to help each other along the path and to share you know and and you do it with your work i mean you you really you do a lot to to distill and synthesize what you're learning and then share it with other people and so i think that's a beautiful model for us to be friends along the path so in that spirit thank you for giving me an opportunity to chat with you all thank you for giving me this opportunity to be your friends along the path as well thank you so much i appreciate it take have care have a good day everybody and thank you so much william take care